Good evening, good evening. Um, thank you so much for being here, uh, folks. Uh, I, I see a whole bunch of generational um, kind of uh, members of our audience, which I really appreciate. Um, some students, some folks, uh, I think from Osher and other um, parts of, of the Upper Valley. Um, so this is uh, a lecture that's sponsored by the Scour Up Family Fund. Um, I'll read <clears throat> according to a letter uh, on the 21st of uh, September, 1992. Uh, the purpose of the Scour Up Family Fund is that a portion of the annual income generated from the fund be utilized to further international economics uh, through a lecture series, open forum, and or final financial publications uh, pertaining to world economics. So um, uh, Sam is a really great uh, sort of kickoff to this series uh, for the Scour Up Family Fund, and we're anticipating a series of, of really exciting um, speakers who will engage with our students and um, who will give public lectures like this. Um, so um, Sam uh, is uh, an economist at the World Bank uh, Development Research Group. Uh, he got his PhD at Harvard, uh, was a postdoc at the Nuffield College, pre-Brexit Oxford, I think, yeah. right? Yeah, um, that's right. Uh, and is also right now an associate at the uh, Center for Policy Research in New Delhi um, and the Center for International Development at Harvard. Um, so. Uh, um, Sam also works very closely with Paul Novosad, so uh, we're really uh, happy that there's a synergy between uh, sponsoring a public lecture and then uh, working with our faculty, because uh, we're small here at Dartmouth. We're not uh, Washington or New York. Uh, Sam comes to us from Washington, so the center of the development universe, and uh, um, uh, obviously Hanover can't reproduce that, um, but hopefully we can amplify our impact um, through these kinds of connections and networks and, and uh, also, hopefully, opportunities for our students. So um, without further ado, thanks a lot, Sam, for coming up. Um, and uh, appreciate you being here. Thanks, folks. Great. Thank you. Uh, can everyone hear me OK? Yeah? Great. Um, well, it's really nice to be back. I always like coming up here. Um, I grew up in rural New England. And I think some of my opinions may be somewhat shaped by, uh, thank you, um, by that experience, as well as time spent in rural India and a lot of other places. Um, so why don't I just give a, a minute or two of, of a little more background on myself before I, I get into this question. I, I should warn everybody that, you know, um, I think my approach to titles for talks has more to do with getting people into the room than my ability to answer the question. So um, it, it, it looks like it worked, which is, which is great. Um, but I should warn everybody that we're definitely not providing a definitive answer to this question. I think in part that's because as social scientists and as economists, we really don't think we ever have like the final answer to, to everything um, or anything. But, but hopefully, we can provide at least food for thought uh, along the way. Um, so yeah, I'm a development economist at the, at the World Bank, at the research group. The research group is like a little academic department within the larger World Bank. And we try to work on the same types of really important uh, questions in development economics that, that Paul and Eric and Nina and others do uh, here in the economics department. Um, we work a lot with, with academia, and, but we're sitting within the World Bank. And what's really cool there is that that means that we get to work very directly on various projects. We know a lot of what comes up. Um, and so if there is interest in the World Bank, as there was last year when I talked to students, um, happy to talk to people afterwards, um, or you can reach out to me. So. Um, I'm coming at this, I grew up in the United States, I grew up in Amherst, Massachusetts, and um, during college I was always a politics junkie, I worked on various things, worked on a, the presidential campaign in 2004 when I, when I left college, but I started getting more and more interested in economic development, I started feeling like the world's biggest and most interesting issues were having to do with poverty, and most of that poverty was, was focused in low-income countries. Um, and so I've always been kind of coming at it from this angle of how do we facilitate economic growth? How do we lift as many people out of poverty as possible? Um, and so I went first to South America and worked in microfinance there. And my experience there, um, I was sort of a cocky and grandiose 23-year-old. Um, and I felt like Latin America wasn't big enough for me. So I uh, decided that I had to go to either India or China, that the 21st century was going to belong to India or China. And um, I felt much more drawn to India. So I went to China and traveled through for a bit uh, <laughs> on my way to, to India. Um, and then spent the next few years 
uh, doing economic research on various anti-poverty programs in India with professors at the MIT, what's now called JPAL, which back then was just PAL. Uh, Jamil had not yet given all that money to, to get his name on it. Um, and so that was a terrific experience because I was living in what for India is sort of a medium-sized city of just a million um, called Udaipur in Rajasthan. It's a little smaller than that. But, um, and it was in the desert, in the hills. It was an absolutely gorgeous city. It's, it's often on like sort of the tourist trail in Rajasthan. Um, but it was absolutely fascinating to be living there and to study it because it's a very conservative place. It's, um, it's not a very industrialized place. It was very unlike many other developing country cities that I had been to previously um, because industries didn't want to locate in the mountains, kind of in the middle of nowhere. Um, and if that was the middle of nowhere, then the areas that I was actually doing my work in were really the middle of nowhere. So this was the tribal belt in southern Rajasthan, um, an area that had been historically neglected by um, government even before the British came along. Uh, actually, there had been an agreement between the king of the area and the tribes living there that he would leave them alone if they just came and fought for him any time someone tried to invade his territory. Um, and so this had been an area without roads, without schools, without much of a presence of the state. Um, and the British didn't really kind of left it alone as well. And then when the Indian government inherited all of these local princely state institutions at independence in 1947, um, this is what they got in this area, and this, uh, this policy of not so benign neglect, in my opinion, uh, carried on and I think really carries on to the present day. Um, and so I was working with an NGO that was trying to fill in all of the holes that the state was leaving. So providing education through various types of schools, um, building infrastructure like these anicuts, which are small da check dams to help recharge the local water table. Um, teaching people about different farming methods, um, organizing community associations and groups to try to build social capital so that these communities could provide some of these things for themselves, uh, and so on and so forth. Um, they really kind of did it all. And I worked on a, a wide range of these things, but with an eye towards trying to provide research um, that, would, that would inform other uh, uh, policies. Um, so I was really struck when I was living there that um, the, the aim of the organization, it was one of these Gandhian organizations um, founded right around independence. And the aim of the organization was to basically keep people in rural areas. They believed that rural areas were absolutely amazing, um, that the heart of India lies in, the, in its villages. And I'll provide you a quote in a little bit on that. Um, but um, that people basically couldn't make a living there, that the world had changed. And you know, groundwater tables are lower, and soil is depleted, um, and technologies have changed in a way that really meant that people couldn't survive in these areas, but they want to. And so they did all these things to try to help them uh, lead better lives, but in these areas. And I was really struck that we were working on this education program. We were running all these schools, and I was doing research on how to make these schools function better, because they had these big problems of teacher absenteeism and low quality and all that kind of thing. Um, and I was really struck that it seemed like every successful student that the organization pointed to, every time someone went and graduated from one of these non-formal education centers and went to get a primary education and even continued on to second, middle or secondary school, none of them were staying in these villages. They were all gone. I wanted to go talk to them about their, their experience in these schools and whatever else, and they all left. And that got me thinking about this issue that I'm working on till this day which is you know, both how can you facilitate growth and poverty reduction and all kinds of good things in rural areas, but also um, just more broadly, how do we most empower people and what are the choices that they actually want to make? And um, that was really an approach that I kind of came to through, through my economics education. And so here I am today. So I should probably turn this thing off so we don't have multiple microphones, right? That's not working. Whatever. Um, OK. So there we go. That was a long introduction to how broadly how I think about things and how I came here. Um, so what am I talking about today? Um, we want to 
alleviate poverty. We want people to live good lives. And the question is really how best to do it. How can people in poor countries come out of poverty? And uh, the vast majority of the world's poor are, in fact, rural, 75%. The vast majority of the world's poor, um, and this is using the, living, the sort of World Bank standard of living below $1 a day in PPP. Um, in purchasing power parity terms. So it's, it's a bit more than a dollar in the US, but still. Um, and so the vast majority of, of very poor people are in developing countries. And not surprisingly, in those countries, they live mostly in rural areas. And that's both because these countries um, have the majority of their population in rural areas, but also because people are much poorer in the countryside than they are in the cities. And um, there are sort of two broad approaches to how do you alleviate poverty? One, and these are not completely distinct, and they're certainly not mutually exclusive. Um, but one is anti-poverty programs. And there are many, many examples of these types of programs. So there are, I work mostly on India, so I, I know the programs there best. Um, but there are workfare programs that guarantee a certain amount of work, um, somewhat similar to the New Deal programs here in the United States. Um, so there are workfare programs where people come together and they get paid a certain amount. Um, it's supposed to be the, low, the, the minimum wage. Um, they often don't get that um, through, because of various problems. But they get paid to work on local projects. And so the projects could be everything from you know, building a dirt road here. And I, in fact, I visited a dirt road that got built five times in a row, uh, kept washing out. And then every year, they would reconstruct it. And interestingly. The, the people there said uh, that they were perfectly happy with this. They were very happy, in fact, with the fact that it kept getting washing out, uh, precisely because they were getting work every year. And they thought that their getting work every year was dependent on the road washing out. Um, or else, what would, what would they do? Um, so th that, that kind of illustrated to me just how much we need to inform people about their entitlements uh, that the government is supposedly guaranteeing, because there's a lot of ignorance about what the, how the program was supposed to work. Um, so there, so there are anti-poverty programs like that. And that, you know, you could think about it starting early on in people's lives, even before people are born. There are all these nutrition programs uh, for soon-to-be mothers. There are neonatal programs trying to make sure that babies are getting adequate nutrition and stimulation early on. Education, and all the way up through kind of adult life. Workfare programs, direct transfers of cash. Um, now there's India is, is pushing forward on um, like health insurance, essentially a Medicaid type program, uh, but only for the very poor. Um, but of course, in India, there are many of the very poor. And so this is going to be quite a large program. Um, and the other, and as I said, it's not mutually exclusive, um, and they definitely work together, is facilitating economic growth. And famously, in India, there was this big debate between Jagdish Bhagwati on the one hand, who's this famous trade economist who provided a lot of the sort of intellectual grist for um, liberalization and opening up of the economy uh, after many, many years of socialism. Um, between him on the one hand saying, we need to prioritize economic growth, and Amartya Sen, the, another very even more famous economist, um, who was saying, we need to focus on social programs. People need health, people need education, and you're not going to get anywhere if you don't build up these things. Now, I don't see these as mutually exclusive in the least. Um, but I think there is only a certain amount of focus that a country often has. Often, actually, some of the economic growth policies that people are talking about come completely free. And so they're really not competing with, uh, uh, with, with other programs. Um, but there is only a certain amount of money to go around. There's only a certain amount of bandwidth. And countries really need to kind of pick their spots to a certain extent. We want to think about like, well, what are the best policies that should be prioritized to lift the most people out of poverty? Um, and so in some sense, what I'm focusing on today is, do we really want to target these programs geographically? Do we really want to say that we're going to, all the, lots of the poor people are in rural areas. And so do we want to have policies that say, stay in rural areas, but come out of poverty? Or do we want to take a somewhat different approach? And there are many different approaches that we could take, um, but that are a bit more agnostic about where they're going to end up living. So here's just uh, one uh, of my favorite quotes, um, very provocative, um, by the great uh, low caste uh, intellectual lawyer, uh, freedom fighter, uh, B.R. Ambedkar. So Ambedkar was 
um, born into an untouchable family in Maharashtra, in central India. And he was the very first uh, untouchable man to go and study overseas. He uh, got scholarships from this progressive king in Western India, um, who he was trying to work for, but actually couldn't end up working for the guy, even though he wanted him to work for him, uh, because he couldn't find anywhere to live, because absolutely no one would rent to a low caste man. And he has this quote, the love of the intellectual Indian for the village community is, of course, infinite, if not pathetic. Uh, he was a bit, bit provocative. Uh, what is a village but a sink of localism, a den of ignorance, narrow-mindedness, and communalism? And I say this not because I think he's just right, though I think he's on to a lot there, um, but because there's been this huge tension between a sort of visions of, of development. What do, you, what do you want society to look like? Do you want it to look like uh, the villages, but with higher living standards? Um, or, or our romanticization of the villages, but with higher living standards? Um, or is it going to involve sort of uh, a lot of change? And some people look to the West and say, well, they're more urbanized. They are, you know, provide higher levels of education, provide higher levels of health. Government is bigger. All these things. Maybe we want it to look like that. Um, and of course, there are many, many different visions. Um, but I think those visions end up getting played out in policy. Um, so what do we know? So historically, there have been three big waves of structural transformation that have generated along the way quite large spatial mismatches. So the first structural transformation was from hunter-gatherers to agriculture. And people, this was a paradigm shift. Agriculture had been invented. People figured out that they could generate a lot more food. Um, but only with settled agriculture and not with moving around and covering a very large area. And this, this was born partly uh, out of scarcity, that people were competing with each other for the large amounts of land that it took for hunter-gatherers to, uh, to survive. Um, it was also because states, um, like James Scott has written really nicely about the ways states really depended on agriculture and really tried to bring people from the hunter-gatherer periphery into these agricultural areas. Tigris and Euphrates, the Nile, uh, the Mekong, all these different places where states formed. Because in order to be a state, you have to tax people. You have to extract resources from them, because that's what supports the king and the clerics and everyone else, right? the administrators, um, and whatever public goods the state might provide or not. Um, but all that requires resources, and you need to be able to tax people. Um, but anyway, that was the first big shift. And interestingly, that actually came with a big drop in living standards. So the archaeological record actually shows that when people made this switch, um, like height went down. Because we can see bones, and height is a really good proxy for overall nutrition. And so height actually went down considerably when they made this switch to agriculture. And we think it was because of a certain amount of diseases from animals that people were never suffering from before. But it was also because of vulnerability to shocks in a way they didn't have as much of with, uh, with hunting and gathering. Anyway, the point there is that it led to this really significant shift in the distribution of the population from kind of spread out all over the place in areas where they could actually hunt and gather for survival to agricultural regions. And so you see this big shift in the population uh, over time. The second is from agriculture to manufacturing. And this is something that the US went through kind of over the last couple hundred years. Uh, it kind of started in the Netherlands and in Britain. Uh, like 300 plus years ago. Uh, different people date it kind of differently. Um, but you know, really, it, it's picked up a lot uh, in more modern times. And this led to a massive reorganization of society and a very large shift in the distribution of population. Um, because before, people were settled in all of the areas that were agricultural, that could survive agriculture of one sort or another. Um, that could be, so in England, you know, that could be the sort of fertile areas, and there are many in England. That could be the hills where um, sheep farming and, and other sorts of herding were possible. But they were basically distributed to take advantage of the land until people were super spread out. Um, and then as the economy moves towards more and more manufacturing, there had been some concentrations of population. London was a big city, but certainly not by the standards of today. Um, it was really an administrative city and an elite city. You tax the rest of the country, and those resources uh, prop up the city. But now these areas started becoming manufacturing hubs. 
And manufacturing wanted to locate in these areas because there was lower transportation costs. They could get the goods, the inputs they needed in. They could get the goods they sold out. Um, but also because you needed a big labor pool to man your factories. Um, you needed uh, other people with expertise to help develop new technologies. And so really, this kind of started in Birmingham more than anywhere else in England. Um, and they just had this huge history of lots of sort of small workshops and things like that. And that ended up really kickstarting the Industrial Revolution. It doesn't work in more remote places. But you did have a lot of different centers of this. And you had a lot of different centers of it in the United States, right? So people started moving off farms and into these urban centers. But they're all over the place. And there are a lot of the places that today we refer to as the Rust Belt, urban areas that aren't doing so well. But once upon a time, Cleveland, Akron, um, Detroit were the frontier of economic growth. Um, and now what we're seeing much more in the United States than in developing countries, though it's happening a little bit in developing countries too, is this shift from manufacturing to services. And that's actually leading to an even greater concentration of the population because services, even more than manufacturing, uh, tend to be concentrated in the, the kind of bigger urban areas. And so, um, but, but really in the United States, this is causing again this kind of big spatial mismatch, precisely that I was just describing with these Rust Belt cities, um, including, frankly, you know, we're talking about today in the Midwest. Um, it happened in, in New England around here much, much earlier. The town I grew up in, Amherst, Massachusetts, like sort of towns in rivers, on rivers across New England, uh, had various industries that got completely wiped out as manufacturing, manufacturing got bigger, as it shifted into the bigger cities, as it shifted west. Um, and so you often, uh, in New Hampshire, in rural Massachusetts, and so on, you drive through these little towns, and they almost all have this like hulking brick building sitting on the river, which was a mill once upon a time that produced shoes or hats or whatever it was. OK. Um, we, there's a lot of romanticization of the village. People do think that, oh, those bullet points didn't come through. Um, but that's all right. Um, but that was basically what I was talking about in the, in the last slide, that people do think that uh, living standards are higher in rural, and, rural areas, all else equal. Um, clean air, fresh water, maybe slower pace of life. Um, there are a lot of things to love. And I guess I'm, I'm giving a talk in one of the smallest towns I ever go to. Um, and so you know, people probably are, share some of that view. I, I share some of that view, too. I've, I've lived in a combination of rural and urban areas. And rural areas have a lot going for them. Um, historically, if we look at the rich countries, whether those rich countries are like the United States, in Europe, East Asia, like South Korea, Taiwan, and others that got rich more recently, but still, um, this was on the back of massive urbanization. Absolutely huge shifts of the population from rural areas into the cities. And um, we know that agglomeration economies make cities more productive for most sectors. I'm not saying that like, you know, agriculture is more productive in cities. It's generally not a great place. Uh, I know there's a movement uh, towards urban agriculture these days. I, I think it's a terrible idea. Um, but uh, I don't see why it's a good use of, of scarce urban land. Um, and we have a hell of a lot of land elsewhere. Um, but we do know that agglomeration economies make cities more productive for a lot of different reasons. Um, so John Marshall 100 years ago talked to, or sorry, Alfred Marshall 100 years ago, um, some Marshall, um, talked about three major agglomeration economies that made cities more productive. And if we think across space, there's, there's kind of a fourth thing that we often talk about. So the fourth thing that we, we often talk about is natural advantage, which is just some locations are more productive than others because they have some natural advantage or another. So historically, you know, if you look at the big East Coast cities, they're pretty much all port cities, Boston, New York. And you wanted like a sheltered harbor, and you wanted some sort of river that led inland. Right? And that connected you to big markets internationally uh, through the port, but also kind of upriver. And so the, um, the Hudson connects urban New York to its rural hinterland up in, uh, up in upstate New York, and then with the Erie Canal to like the whole Midwest. And that was a huge advantage for New York. Um, but then there are these three agglomeration economies. And what we mean by agglomeration economies are factors that make economic activity want to be around other economic activity that make you more productive for being in a dense, large place. Um, and those are uh, thick labor markets, uh, ideas markets, and what's the third one? <laughs> labor markets, ideas, um, and input-output markets. Um, and so input-output means 
buying and selling from other firms. So if you're a firm that sets up in Hanover, chances are the people you do business with are quite far away. And so you're going to pay costs for that. Um, in ideas markets, you know, people get ideas from other people. And so if I'm in a very rural place, chances are there are not a whole lot of other inventors or business people or innovators around me. Um, and the labor markets are probably best exemplified, though I think all of these things are, are well exemplified by Silicon Valley, where in Silicon Valley, um, if I'm starting a tech firm, if I want to start a tech firm in Hanover or even in Washington, D.C. to some extent, it's going to be relatively hard for me to find the really skilled, experienced programmers who I need. And I need some web developers, and I need some other types of programmers, and all these different types of people, right? And then I need some finance, and I need all these other things. These are all labor markets. I want to poach people from other firms who have experience. And that's just very, very hard to do in rural areas because where are those people? So, um, so that's agglomeration economies and why cities are, are relatively productive compared to rural areas. Um, we also know that economic growth has been the single biggest driver of poverty alleviation throughout history. Um, and this happens for sort of two broad reasons. Um, one is that society accumulates more human capital, more physical capital, um, more produ productivity. That's one driver of, of economic growth. But there's another one, which is this reallocation. Right? And, the, and the structural transformations I was talking about, that's exactly reallocation from one sector to another from hunting and gathering to agriculture, from agriculture to manufacturing, manufacturing to services. Um, but that's also a spatial phenomenon, as I was saying. right? And so um, nowadays, in the United States, that reallocation happens in part by people moving out of less productive, often less dense areas to these sort of islands of high productivity. And these islands of high productivity in the United States are New York and San Francisco and Boston. Obviously, they're not the only ones. Um, but these are very, very high productivity places, and so that's, um, that's where people are moving towards, if they let them. And that's part of uh, what I'll talk a little bit about. So I, was, I just want to make sure I'm not taking too much time. Okay, so we're, this is going till 5.30, right? Good. Um, I'll pick up the pace a little. So there's a lot of work that's been done in, in developing countries trying to grow rural areas built on the romanticization, but also built on the fact that most of the poor people, as I said, are actually in these rural areas. And so let's try to make life good for them. So there's this old, what's often referred to as the Johnston-Meller hypothesis, um, or alternately called agriculture-led development, which says, look, most of the people are in agriculture, and growing agriculture is going to have all of these benefits besides just directly improving their incomes. It's also going to kickstart non-agricultural growth. And that can be through providing uh, demand for non-agricultural goods and services um, that people were too poor to afford before, so no one's going to go into it. Uh, it can provide capital. If you have agricultural surpluses, you can take those surpluses and invest in other things. Um, and that's really going to kind of kickstart this, what's often called modern economic growth or modern economic activity, which really means just manufacturing and services. Um, now, there have been huge attempts to, grow, grow, uh, to cause growth in rural areas. Um, and we're starting to get so, a bunch of evidence that often they don't work so well. Um, so I'll talk about a, I mean, just a few of our papers. We have a paper on rural roads. Um, the Indian government and various others, like the World Bank, who funded part of this program, um, were promising huge economic growth on the back of this $40 billion program, which is aiming to connect all of India's villages to the paved road network. I'm definitely not saying this is a bad thing. I think every village should have a connection to the outside network. And in fact, villages should have roads inside of them, as well as just connecting them to the outside. But um, contrary to their expectations, it actually really didn't do much for headline economic growth. So if you look at living standards as we measure through income and through assets, those didn't change significantly. Uh, if you look at non-farm firms, that didn't change much. Um, and even if you look at agriculture, agricultural practices, which everyone thought were going to really change dramatically, those didn't change. And as we can measure it, we have to use satellite imagery in this case, um, that didn't seem to go up either. So it's not that rural roads aren't a good thing. I'm sure they provide people. I've done a lot of qualitative work in these areas. They do seem to provide access to some services. We actually have a paper showing that education goes up in these areas when you provide a road connecting them to the outside market. We do see a little bit of a decrease in agricultural employment. Um, and it looks like it's probably by connecting you to outside markets. But they didn't cause a whole lot of economic growth or change in living standards. 
Uh, another, another paper from India studying massive electrification program um, found that there weren't big effects of rural electrification on, on economic outcomes. We have a paper now on canals trying to really test this Johnston-Miller hypothesis and say, look, the British and then, uh, and then the, the Indian government, particularly around the time of the Green Revolution, um, when the new, more advanced and more productive crops required um, a lot of water, built these canals into all these areas. India is semi-arid, as are many developing countries. These canals get built in these areas. They lead to a huge increase in agricultural productivity. It basically opens up another growing season. Um, but we actually don't see much of an effect on non-farm jobs. It actually looks like there's crowd out of non-farm jobs. There's specialization in agriculture, and that's that. And there's a nice, uh, there's a really nice theory paper um, by Matsuyama in 1992 that basically showed that agriculture can cause growth in the non-farm sector, and if that then has increasing returns to scale, you know, subsequent economic growth, but that really only happens in a closed economy. So if you're cut off from the rest of the world, you precisely need to free up that labor, and you need to generate capital that can then be invested in other sectors. Um, and you need demand for non-agricultural goods and services. But actually, in an open economy, when you're connected to the rest of the world, there's absolutely no need for you to grow your own food, or even a surplus of food, right? And in the most extreme example, like, I don't grow any food, and I'm, and I'm doing okay. Um, um, there have been other major programs to try to increase education in areas. Um, that seems to have some returns, but not, not huge returns in rural areas, and as I said, um, Often that leads to migration to the cities where the returns to those skills, to that additional education is higher. Um, as well as a lot of policies of the current president, which is really promising to bring economic growth back to the areas that lost them, to the rural areas and to the small towns that have shed a lot of jobs and are really suffering for it. And I have to say I'm very skeptical um, of the ability uh, of policy, um, unless you're in like a completely command and control state-run economy to push economic activity back towards areas where it left because it was less, it was less uh, productive there. So coming out of all of these difficulties in causing growth in rural areas, I kind of want to know why do we have to cause growth in rural areas? Is that really the best use of our resources? Um, and resources are, are limited. They're scarce. That's true in a rich country like the United States. It's especially true in poor countries. Uh, like India or Kenya, where they're really having to make major trade-offs. They don't have enough resources in schools to educate all the kids. They don't have enough resources in health to provide basic health care to everybody. They don't have enough resources to provide paved roads to all the villages or electrification 24 hours a day. So they're making these huge trade-offs about like what actually is going to have the highest return. And um, as you're making those trade-offs, you really want to think about, like, do these have to be do these people have to stay in place, and do these policies have to be targeted at these areas? So here's a, a nice graph of urbanization uh, throughout history. And what you can see here, I guess the reason why I'm going in this direction is, is saying that despite all of this, and despite showing how hard it is in rural areas, urbanization ain't a cakewalk either. Um, and so what you see here is annual urban growth rates over the years. Um, so here's Europe from 1700 all the way up to 1950. And what you can see here is that urbanization was a really gradual process. It took off, but basically never was it much above 2% per year, okay, in the growth rates uh, of these cities. Now, look over here, just from 1900 to the present in various lower income regions of the world, Africa, Asia, Latin America, and Middle East and North Africa. And what you can see here is that basically throughout this period, growth rates have been way higher than was ever observed at any point in Western history. So these countries are growing considerably faster, actually, than ever happened in, in uh, Western areas. Their population grew faster. Um, their economies are sometimes growing faster. Um, and certainly urbanization is going way, way up. People are moving to cities in much higher numbers than we ever have seen before. And that's leading to mega cities like Bombay, like Shanghai, Bangkok, Nairobi, Lagos. Um, this is true in countries that are growing, that have grown a ton, like China. But this is also true in countries whose growth records actually haven't been that impressive. Um, throughout Sub-Saharan Africa, for example. 
And there are huge challenges of mass urbanization. So I, I, you know, I've sort of been saying that I think that urbanization is inevitable and an important part of economic growth, but there are huge, huge challenges here. Um, so just a few problems to address. One is sanitation. People generally have poor access to basic sewage that we take for granted in areas urban or rural in the United States. Um, property rights, and I say rural and urban because in urban areas, you often have slums and property rights are unclear and that depresses investments in people's housing, just gives a lot of anxiety from not, be, not knowing whether you're gonna be able to stay in your house. Um, that's really important to sort out in urban areas so that good investments can be made um, because of course urbanization requires huge investments. You gotta build urban areas. And that requires not just government investments like roads and sewers, but also just private people making a lot of investments to build out the built infrastructure in urban areas. Um, what we think of as cities, when you think of New York, you think of like the skyline, and you think of all these buildings, those were privately built almost entirely. And so people need to have secure property rights in order to make these massive investments that are gonna pay off over literally centuries often. Um, cities also have quite high costs of living. In the United States, San Francisco and New York have extremely high costs of living relative to, say, Hanover. Um, in India, Delhi and Bombay have very high costs of living compared to the rural areas that I was working in uh, in Rajasthan. But they also have, as I said, because of agglomeration economies and other things, um, they have much higher wages. Um, but these are, these are problems that really need to be sorted out. One of the things on, on housing and cost of living is there are actually often big restrictions on density. So Boston and DC have all of these historic areas that they basically say you can't build anything new there. And so it's all two-story row houses when actually the markets kind of want to put up big buildings, um, which because of all the, the benefits of density, I didn't, one of the benefits of density that I didn't mention is also in terms of transportation. So public transportation works especially well when you have a lot of people living around it, right? Urban rail network, like the metro in DC or the subway in New York or the T in Boston, they work really well at moving people from one station to another, but they don't work so well if there aren't that many people living around these stations. And so that's a, yet another benefit of, of density here. Um, but we have very, very high cost of living in cities. Um, and I think a lot of those are self-inflicted wounds. Uh, a lot of those are policy decisions to, to limit density, um, to make it difficult to build, to add more. It's not that we cities have a fixed amount of space. You build space. They have a fixed amount of land. Though even that can, in some sense, be expanded upon by building out rail networks and transportation networks into the rural areas. Um, but they do have only a certain amount of space unless you build more. And so there's a lot, I think, that we can do to make uh, cost of living go down by, by expanding uh, the building stock. Um, the point here, oh, so one last thing on property rights. The reason why I say rural as well as urban, so I talked about urban property rights and security of tenure. It's been shown that actually insecure property rights in rural areas also prevents people from moving and taking advantage of new economic act opportunities. Because if you are worried that someone is gonna take your farm, you're not gonna leave that farm. You better stay on that farm and protect it. But actually, um, and, and we think that actually this contributes to like say the small farm sizes in India, not enough people are moving out of these areas. Even though wages are higher, and there's been a lot of work documenting these rural urban wage gaps that show that actually people make a lot more, even in real terms, despite the higher prices um, for moving to urban areas. But you're not gonna do it if your one major asset is going to be lost the minute you leave it, right? And so that really prevents a lot of this reallocation that we think is a necessary part of growth. Um, and so all of these things are gonna benefit current urban dwellers, incumbent urban dwellers who are there, and they're suffering from bad sanitation. Though I should point out in the case of sanitation, we make a very big deal of urban sanitation, and urban sanitation is genuinely bad in developing country cities, right? You go to Delhi and like, you walk through some neighborhoods and it smells terrible. Um, that, it actually smells terrible because there is some sort of system that's trying to move waste out of there and that's just open and exposed. Um, but it's bad. Um, it's worse in rural areas. I mean, there's nowhere in rural areas with sewage. Um, and a lot of work um, by Diane Coffey and Dean Spears and others has shown that there are actually very, very high costs of open defecation and the lack of sewage in rural areas. Um, but anyway, so these things, all these improvements in urban areas are going to benefit urban dwellers, but they're really also going to benefit rural people by allowing more people to take advantage of all of these urban opportunities that I've described. And so we don't want to think about the cities as, you know, 
Delhi has 20 million people, we want to think about it as 20 million people are going to benefit from any of these policies, plus however many other people are going to find it easier to live there and advantageous to live there and be able to take advantage of these opportunities um, when uh, these things get better. OK, let me just wrap up. Um, so first, on some broad principles that I, for policymaking, I mean, this is by far the most subjective part of the talk, though this whole talk has been fairly subjective compared to talks I usually give. Um, so one is that programs should focus on, on as much on facilitating economic growth as on providing direct poverty assistance. Um, and so in the case of, for example, India's workfare program, the whole emphasis has been uh, called NREGA, the National Rural Employment Guarantee. The emphasis has been as much, uh, the emphasis has been, sorry, almost entirely on getting cash out to people. Now there's another part of the program which is the creation of rural public goods. Building, building roads, uh, uh, building sewage. I mean, it's a whole number of different things that they're trying to do. Um, but there have actually been very active limits on how much they can do. For example, like you're not, you're, you have to have the vast majority of costs be going into, cap, into labor and not capital, which means you can only build a dirt road, which gets washed away every year. Whereas if you're really serious about kind of improving um, not just the lives of the people who are getting the direct benefits, but, the, but, but everyone else's lives, you would really be trying to say, how can we build productive assets in these rural areas that often lack them. And that could be everything from an irrigation tank, like building a little lake that can store water so that you can save water from the monsoon and use it in the other season, um, to roads, to whatever else people are able to build. Um, so one is, is kind of renewing a bit of emphasis on economic growth. Um, I think a lot of us in development economics uh, rightly focus a lot on programs that are direct choices of governments and how to make those work better, because they often don't. But I, I think more, a lot more work is needed on growth as well. Um, the second is give people more choices. So design policies in ways that really help people, but also give them choices. So again, in the case of this rural employment guarantee, there's been some nice work um, showing that they kind of they reduce migration to a large extent because it's a rural employment guarantee. So why not have an employment guarantee everywhere, get money into the hands of poor people, I don't see the reason for why it has to be rural. They can make that choice, and a lot of people will stay rural because they prefer it, and good for them. I, I see no reason to push people into the cities necessarily, but I certainly don't want to hold them down in the rural areas either. Um, uh, and, I, and I cited Amartya Sen's book, Development as, Free, uh, as Freedom, which is one of my absolute favorite books, and one of the reasons why I got into development, I, I highly recommend it, and it's not that long. Um, the th so, so a version of this is, is making programs location neutral. I think I've already talked about that. Another example of this is transferability of benefits. So oftentimes, people find it very hard to move across space, not for all of the reasons of high costs in urban areas and difficult finding an urban job and whatever else, but just because a lot of the benefits they get are kind of stuck in their place. And so it's really hard to get their kids enrolled in urban schools. And it's hard to gain access to, like, healthcare that the government is providing in an area other than your village. It's actually not just a, a rural bias or a rural urban bias. It, um, it happens as much in rural areas. It's just that not that many people want to move from one rural area to another. But it's hard to take your health benefits in India and move them to a village nearby. Um, or the public distribution system, which is food aid to people. A lot of these things, it's just really, really hard um, to take them anywhere else. Um, and, and somewhat related to, to sort of my call for more uh, research on growth, also a renewed focus on urban policies. Um, you know, Lant Pritchett at one point, uh, who was for a very long, he was at the World Bank and then he was a professor at the Kennedy School and now he's helping to develop the development uh, policy program at Oxford. He had this really nice blog post at one point that said, as development economists, we should really be focusing on things that, and he had a series of criteria, um, that fast growing countries are doing more than slow growing countries. But another one is that rich countries have more of than poor countries. And so he sort of used the example of self-help groups. No offense to self-help groups, but he was saying, look, it's not that rich countries have a ton of self-help groups that are helping to keep us rich, help make us rich or keep us rich. Um, but we're, we're really seeing this as like a, a great thing in, in uh, developing countries. It's not necessarily a bad thing, but it's probably not going to facilitate the kind of really large-scale growth that's going to lift a ton of people out of, out of poverty. And so... Yeah, I think we need more focus on urban policies like health, sanitation, property rights, all those things I talked about. Um, 
And so this is sort of, as, as I'm wrapping up, you know, one thing I think we really need to do more of is, is study what makes cities successful. And that, just, that doesn't just have to be in developing countries. One example I use a lot of is that we talk a lot about corruption in developing countries. We talk about how, how bad the police is, how corrupt, discriminatory, all these things. Um, well, we talk about it in, in rich countries too, but it's a lot better now in New York City than it was almost 100 years ago with Boss Tweed and Tammany Hall. Um, and it was really like, you know, the police were essentially a mafia. And, um, and so I think that we can do a lot more sort of economic historical work saying, well, what did rich countries get right? What were the, how did they manage? How did New York manage to shift that equilibrium? We think corruption is an equilibrium. It's really hard to get out of it. But somehow these changes took place in our country and in many other countries. And we often don't understand that very well. Um, and then the very last idea that I'm throwing out there is actually a subsidy rather than a tax on migration. So what I told you is that there are lots of taxes on migration. There are lots of frictions that make it really hard for people to pick up and go elsewhere. Um, but if they are actually, um, if they are not only private benefits, but actually public benefits to people moving into the cities, such as living standards in rural areas go up because there's now more land per person that often isn't, that isn't necessarily internalized by the migrant. Or the fact that through these agglomeration economies, they're making everybody more productive in the cities that they're moving to, then maybe we want to actually consider, instead of throwing up all these barriers, we might even want to facilitate people's move. Because essentially, moving is like paying a one-time big cost. And we know that people are short-sighted. God knows I am. Um, but people are paying this one-time cost to move their whole families and everything else. It's a huge hassle. It's a huge pain, even in the United States, and even when you're relatively well off. It's really hard on a poor family um, for these long-run benefits. And I talk to people in, you know, in, in my auto drivers in Delhi who are in the urban areas. They, they sort of miss the villages, but they're like, oh, no, I'm never going back there because my kids are getting a good education here, and they're going to have all these opportunities. So you have these super long-run benefits of migrating, whereas you have a one big short-term cost. So maybe we want to actually help people get over that hump and uh, move to cities. So, you know, I hope I've thrown out a lot of food for thought and discussion. Um, I definitely took a lot longer than I expected to. Um, but you know, on that note, and with these kind of ideas in mind, why don't we open it up for questions and discussion? Hi. Uh, for the last decade, I've spent time in Honduras pretty much every year um, with a group conducting medical and educational projects in a remote village. And, uh, of course, when we go there, we fly into the city, but we get out of there as fast as possible because of the violence, the gangs, the, the drugs, the crime. Yeah. Um, we feel wonderfully safe in our village. Um, how do you account for that those dangers in, in your proposal. Is there ultimately some Malthusian effect at play here of danger of overpopulating cities that result in some of this? Or is it more, you briefly talked about New York City and the improvements in life and behavior over centuries there. How, how do you see that effect playing out? Yeah. Um, so, you know, I, I should say, I think violence in cities is one example of what people often refer to as congestion costs, which are sort of the problems that increase as you get more density, as places get bigger. Um, and in those places, you don't just have like congestion on the streets, but you also actually have like a depersonalization of a lot of interactions, right? And so people know fewer of the people that they interact with, um, and there's in some sense less, in some, in way, some ways, less social capital. Um, because people don't know each other so much, and they're surrounded by so many strangers. And that can lead potentially to, to more violence. Um, I think Honduras is a really good example where there are big gaps in violence between rural and urban areas. That's not everywhere the case, interestingly. There's some really nice work um, by uh, Paul's and my friend Martina Kirchberger and, and Doug Gollin um, showing that actually in sub-Saharan Africa, a lot of these uh, rural urban gradients as you move from less 
dense areas to more dense areas, they, they thought they were going to find big differences in a whole bunch of bads, violence, water pollution, air pollution. It turns out that actually the rural areas have a lot of these things as well, and it's pretty damn flat. Um, I don't think that's everywhere the case, and, and I think we want to take into account these things. Um, but um, you know, rural areas can often have a lot of violence, and the reason why I think that's flat is in part because actually the state has a very low presence. And one of the things that's going on in places like Honduras is actually the state is not in control. It does not have a monopoly of violence, right? And, and interestingly, we think historically that the state has done a better job of getting a monopoly on violence in the cities, where it's relatively easy to project that, and then kind of in some sense or simultaneously, you know, it's happening in the rural areas, but it's a bit easier for that to happen in the cities. Um, and there have been big changes in levels of crime, even in the United States, right? There, there was sort of a spike in crime in the 80s in a lot of cities, Washington and New York and so on, um, that th these crime rates have gone way, way down. So I think we absolutely need to understand the determinants of violence. Um, and there are some differences that, that tilt things towards a little more violence in the cities. Um, but it's, it's not as simple a picture as, as I think Honduras paints. I think they want it for the video. In, I work mostly in West Africa. And there, the, I think the problems are quite different. Most governments seem to have adopted policies uh, for political reasons of having cheap food in the cities yeah. and undercutting rural farmers by importing food at subsidized prices from uh, surplus producing countries, including the United States. Absolutely. And of course, foreign aid actually aggravates that. So that one of the reasons that rural farmers are not viable in a country like Senegal or Mali is because the governments are actually worried about urban unrest caused by having expensive food that would support a rural economy. Yep. Um, I'm concerned because your proposal to subsidize rather than uh, tax migration would actually aggravate that problem, at least in many African countries. And just a counterpoint, um, in Vermont, the governor has proposed a subsidy on people migrating to rural areas, carrying jobs. If, if they bring a job with them and they're willing to do it remotely, they'll get a, up to a $10,000 subsidy. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, so, OK, quickly on, on Vermont. I mean, I think the, the challenge of Vermont is that they recognize that they have too few people in these areas, that they're not realizing the agglomeration economies. They're not providing a big foundation for a modern economy. And so they are trying to attract more people. And that is you know, a reasonable thing for the governor of a rural state to think of doing, because he's constrained by his state. And so he can't, he's not going to say to his people, like, hey, everybody, move out of here and go to cities, because you're going to have a better standard of living there. He's going to say, how can we possibly build up Vermont? Um, he or she, sorry, I actually don't know who the governor of Vermont is. Um, he? OK, good. So I got it right, uh, accidentally. Um, and yeah, on the, on the other issue, I, I think you're absolutely right. I don't think that all subsidies are just going to rural areas. I think there are a lot of examples of subsidies to rural areas. But you're absolutely right that there are urban biased policies. And I think that's as much of a mistake as the rural ones. It might be a little bit less of a mistake for the reasons that I described. There are increasing returns to scale in urban areas, you know, one-time cost of migration versus long-run benefits. Like all these things might be pointing in the direction of why it might be a good idea to subsidize. I don't think that countries are necessarily acting out of this motivation all the time. As you said, Robert Bates and others have shown really nicely how um, basically states have have organized transfers of uh, of wealth from rural to urban areas in order to to stem urban unrest. Um, so yeah, I, th I think we want to think hard about all of these kind of spatial policies. Um, I don't think we want to take for granted the idea that if you got rid of some of these you know, transfers from rural to urban, that all of a sudden agriculture is going to be super viable in all of these places, and people are going to be having great lives on the back of small scale agriculture. Um, I think if you look around the world at a lot of places where um, there aren't those kind of subsidies, farmers are really still struggling. They're moving in large numbers to the cities, um, despite all the friction set against them and the lack of subsidies in urban areas. And 
there are a lot of different reasons for this, but I think one thing that's worth noting is that we make a very big deal of the difference in farm incomes between a place like the United States, where farmers do well, and a place like India or Senegal, where we think that farmers are, on average, quite poor. Um, the biggest single determinant of farm incomes is how much land you have to play with, okay? the land labor ratio. And in the United States, farmers have like 100 times more than they do in a place like Senegal. So yes, it's true that look, the US has good land, and they have tractors, and they have fancy weather modeling, and all kinds of other things, um, very good irrigation. But a large part of it is just scale. And one of the things that happens when you move from rural to urban areas is you increase the land labor ratio in the rural areas. You leave land behind that someone else can now farm. So a farmer who just had an acre and you had an acre, sell or rent that to that guy, and now he has two acres, and he can start making investments in things like irrigation and all that. So you know, I, don't, I think I'm, I'm making a stronger case for urbanization than um, is absolutely necessary or warranted, um, because I'm trying to be provocative and I'm trying to get people to think about these issues. I think we absolutely, you know, if people want to stay in rural areas, we want them to be able to stay in rural areas, but um, not at a great cost to the rest of society. And so, yeah, we should get all of these distortionary policies that are distorting activity across space. We should get these right. And maybe that'll help a few more people stay in rural areas in Senegal, but I suspect that even in the absence of all of these policies, huge numbers of people in West Africa will continue pouring into the cities. Uh, yeah. Um, so from what you've talked about, it sounds like it's kind of a positive feedback loop in terms of urbanization creating more prosperity, which would then kind of decrease some of the congestion effects that would disincentivize people to move to the cities in the first place. Um, kind of long term, where do you see like an equilibrium kind of forming between like rural population and urban populi population? Because even the United States it seems like even though it's really developed and you would think that like possibly there would be a chance that like we would have reached an equilibrium kind of point, you still see that rural populations are shrinking relative to urban populations. And so, yeah, that's just kind of my question. Yeah. I mean, my broad take on this is that I don't, if we mean by equilibrium some sort of steady, steady balance between the two, I don't think we're ever going to get there because technology is constantly evolving, policies are constantly evolving, that's shifting the balance not just between rural and urban, but between the coasts and the, the center of the country, you know, flat areas versus hilly areas, all these things. And over time, they've shifted. Hunter-gatherers really like, we're, you know, we're very well off in the hills, hard to do agriculture in the hills, so people moved down into the valleys, and then they moved into small towns, and they moved into cities. I don't think that it's necessarily the case that you're just going to have people continuing to stream into cities until the world is 99.9% .9 urban. There's certainly something to be said for rural areas um, in terms of, of quality of living. Um, and you know, one of the things that people talk a lot about these days is that with information technology, both a larger share of the economy being in information technology, but just the, um, the ability to move information very quickly across space, um, and people mostly working with information, that we might see a kind of swing back towards rural areas where people can benefit can realize a bunch of these benefits while simultaneously you know, doing whatever jobs they, they were doing before. And my parents, actually, when we moved to Amherst, were early examples of that. Uh, my dad was a lawyer. His clients were not in Amherst at all, but he was able to do that work. He was sort of an early telecommuter. And my mom, as well, where she would go to developing countries and work on, on their education programs and then come back. And she would write and was able to do all the research and all of the compiling of information that she needed to do. But she could do it from Amherst just as easily as she could do it from DC. Um, so, yeah, I don't think there's going to be this like really stable, steady state because the world keeps on changing. Um, and it is certainly possible that with a bunch of uh, new technologies that really effectively reduce the distance between different areas, that you may see some sort of shift back towards rural areas. Um, I will say though that you know, in some sense, we think that if you just look at it, like the tech industry could be the most decentralized. You could have a programmer here. You could have a programmer there. Everyone can work together because you know it's really easy to sync up all the information that we're all generating, all the code that we're all writing. Um, but that is just not the case. It's actually the most highly agglomerated industry. And they're paying absolutely massive prices to be in the Bay Area. 
for example. And when Amazon is looking for a new uh, second headquarters uh, until New York kind of screwed it up, um, it was going to be in a combination of New York and DC. Now it's just going to be DC. Um, you know, they were looking in the biggest cities. And despite the fact that you can just send everything that these guys are doing at the speed of light all around the world. And there is some of that, right? In, in India, you get a lot of tech services. It is happening somewhat. But we're really not seeing what a lot of people predicted as this like big decentralization of economic activity that's going to come from effectively reducing distances between places. Still, agglomeration economies are super, super important. Yeah, way back. My question is, um, my understand, I may be wrong with this, but my understanding of the entire idea of sort of pro-urbanization approach to development sort of joy, uh, to me appears like a micro scale of the entire narrative of development uh, of globalization where we have um, the developing countries just being somewhere behind and having to follow these inevitable paths of industrialization. Um, which we see in most ways it has like actually interrupted the development trajectory for those countries and not really helped as we also see with the structural adjustment programs and other World Bank led um, interventions. Um, so with this approach, how are we ensuring that we're not replicating the same challenges of disrupting the trajectories? I, I sort of think like maybe these villages or the rural areas are in their own uh, trajectories of development which may be pretty much different from the cities. How do we ensure that we don't sort of micro scale the problem from the global to the local um, level? I don't know if my question is clear. Yeah, 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 it is. Um, so I'm not sure I see things entirely the same way you do, um, but I think that at the core, I'm, I'm interpreting your question at least, um, and please correct me if I'm getting it wrong, is we really don't want to be forcing people into what isn't the right fit for them. And so that could be forcing a farmer to go do something else. That could be forcing a village to try to get into some other economic activity other than the one its sort of path is taking it on. Um, and, and developing country cities, we don't want to force them to just look like New York or look like London or Paris. And I think that's exactly right. When I think about and I get into a lot of conversations like this with people at the World Bank, but also policymakers in different countries. I don't think we want to have a specific vision of the world and say, OK, what do we need to get there? It's really interesting to me that when you talk to policymakers all over, they're like, oh, um, you know, food processing is the next industry that we should be doing because we have agriculture. And that's the one that's going to add a bunch of value and, and lead to, to growth in this country. That one might not be so crazy, but um, th there are sometimes some way more out there things where very, very poor countries think that they can get into aerospace manufacturing. And they're like, look, aerospace manufacturing seems to generate a huge amount of surplus, so how do we get there? Um, and, and I think that's, that's probably a mistake. Um, what I think is a better approach to policymaking is saying, what, is, what are the policies that we can have that maximize uh, economic and other opportunities for people to make choices that are best for them. And if people want to stay in the villages, then they can. We don't want to push them out of the villages. Um, they can completely stay there. Um, but I think that what you see around the world is even while developing countries, in my opinion, completely screw up their urban policies. They completely screw them up in so many different ways. Um, we do too, by the way. The US screws up its urban policies horribly. Um, you still see just massive amounts of people flooding into the cities for, for more opportunities. And so I, but more broadly, I just think that we want to invest in capabilities and not in very specific visions. And so we want to invest in transportation networks that anybody can use for any purpose. You can ship goods. You can, people can move. They can make whatever choices are good for them that we do all the time here. Um, you want to invest in electricity. You want to invest in education. Now, of course, there are a lot of judgment calls about what kind of education are you providing. But you, know, you want to equip people with skills that they can then use to do whatever. And if they can start a business in the village that they're from, more power to them. You absolutely don't want to in any way stand in the way of that. Um, but empirically, what we've seen is that often that doesn't happen. 
So during your talk, you said that um, we should look at what rich countries did right. And I think what rich countries did right is exploit poor countries. And you say that corruption like is really like been solved in New York. No corruption has just moved up levels. And I think that's an to some extent a natural process in that situation. Um, either way, you speak of incentives um, that would like provide sort of populations moving into cities with more incentive incentives to move to, move into cities and creating that uh, loop. Um, and it seems like by moving those people into cities or by incentivizing them, you also are driving them in a situation which has its unique challenges and putting them in a situation which entangles a certain kind of population and then there's no out at some point. Uh, and if you look at cities like um, New York um, and San Francisco, if we're going to look at what rich countries did, then you can very clearly see poor populations, which are very uh, significantly st uh, struggling with higher costs of living and sort of stuck in those cities now. And it seems like at the end, your suggestion doesn't really solve one of the largest problems which you're facing, which is the large divide between the wealthiest and the poor and the most poor, which is a relative thing. And even though we might say, oh, people on the average are getting like, wealthier and being alleviated out of poverty, I think to some extent like the benefit goes ultimately to the rich to the wealthiest again because the more you have cities saturated with people from all over, the more accessible, cheap labor you have. Um, and so my question is have you like how how would you sort of respond to that? <laughs> yeah, I mean that's I just have those thoughts. Yeah. Um, there's a lot there. Um, let me just say, I don't think it's as clear as you put it that these problems that you described are so much worse in cities. Um, in rural areas, there are absolutely massive inequalities. Go to a village in India, and you have people who own large amounts of land, and you have the majority who own little to no land. Huge inequalities. And there was a nice paper that was done in Pakistan that even showed that the elites stand in the way of development because it's going to lose them their cheap labor. Where is the labor cheapest in the world? In rural areas and developing countries, by far. And so if you want access to just that, you go to those places. But you can't really be that productive with that cheap labor um, because A, it's not very skilled, and B, it's far away from everything. Um, and so. I completely agree with your broader point, though, that we need to worry about inequality. I think inequality is a huge problem. I think that it leads to political capture. I think that it leads to social unrest. I think it leads to, um, I think the idea of relative poverty and how you experience your poverty is right. Um, though I think a lot more work needs to be done on, on how much that matters relative to just absolute poverty. Um, I don't know how much of a landless person in rural northern India is worrying about the fact that like, you know, someone is rich somewhere else. I think they're worrying about like, how to feed their family. And so um, in contexts where people are struggling to do the very basics of how to feed their family and get their kids basic education and get everyone basic health, um, I think that I'm a little bit less worried about relative poverty, except to the extent that it can block development. Um, but I'm, but it's, it's, it's something that's absolutely worth worrying about everywhere. Um, and yes, should be taken into account when we design policies. Yeah. How how late should we go, Ken? Yeah, I don't mind at all. Oh, this is fun. Great. Yeah. So I'm going to focus more on your agnostic approach of just facilitating economic growth and uh, giving people more choices. Um, ultimately, that requires money. And the money is either going to come from without or within. And in a lot of the countries, uh, un undeveloped, poorly developed countries, there is a traditional elite, and then there is a newer economic elite. And both populations are very good at avoiding taxes. And so you, you emasculate the states because they do not have the funds to invest in these larger issues within states or outside of states in the rural areas. Totally. And they're not particularly interested 
in putting money into them because they educate their kids here or elsewhere, and they live a life in their countries but also outside of their countries. Right. So I don't want to give a speech, but are there examples where that ugly paradigm has been overcome in some developing nations versus a state where it's horrible. Honduras is probably an example. Guatemala is an example. Almost all of Central, Amer Central America, so Costa Rica is an ex example of the bad story. Is there a positive and then how? <laughs> so, okay. Um, point one on that is that you're absolutely right that there are elites who can stand in the way of progress for others um, everywhere. And I think we want to take that seriously. Um, and that's true in rural areas with large landowners who don't necessarily. But at the same time, those large landowners often make investments that other people can't make because they can afford it. They have the ability to lobby the state for electrification because they want some power for their house and then other people get it. So I, I wouldn't, I don't think it's so simple. And actually there's some evidence um, in Latin America that the areas that had big haciendas, which were extremely exploitative, right? And were basically kind of borderline slavery in many ways, um, ended up with more public goods because those guys were able to lobby the state uh, more effectively and provide some of them on their own. So I think we need to be worried about the power of elites and about the incentives of elites, what they're interested in. You're absolutely right that this idea of exit, where elites can kind of check out of the public system and therefore don't care as much about the quality of it, whether that's in education or health or even roads if they're taking their helicopters around. Um, you know, that the rich do exit. What's that? I mean, it's a bit cartoonish. Yeah, it is a bit cartoonish. Yeah, yeah. I'm, well, I'm, trying, to, I'm trying to kind of exaggerate this a bit. But, like, um, but I, I don't think that they're... So you want to be concerned about these issues, but I don't think it's so obvious that elites everywhere really stand in opposition to progress. I think elites are very interested in economic growth. And they really, as was pointed out, they benefit a lot from economic growth. But so does everyone else. And so um, the, you know, rich countries, the poor have way higher standards of living than in poor countries. So has there been a bunch of exploitation? Yes. Is there currently exploitation? Yes, though I'm not really sure what we mean a lot of the time when we say exploitation. And I, I think that's worth kind of dwelling on a lot more and not worth getting into now. But, um, but I don't think it's so obvious that, that elites everywhere kind of stand in opposition to progress for anyone else. Um, the second thing I would say I, that, you, that you asked about was, are there success stories? I, I think every rich country is a success story. I think every middle-income country that used to be a poor country is a success story. I think every um, upper low-income country is a success story over lower. I mean, there are just all these examples of economic growth and progress throughout. I, I, I was limiting it to uh, developing, uh, developing regions. Let's say Central South America and Africa. And, 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 and South Asia. Europe, United States, Canada. No, no, sure. But I, but I think, you know, I, I think um, within... Latin America, um, Colombia, amazingly, despite like huge violence, uh, is a middle-income country and has sustained that. Um, and the poor in Colombia are much better off than the poor in a lot of other places in Latin America. Um, I'm not saying that Colombia has gotten everything right. I a am not a scholar of Colombia, and b I'm sure that they get tons of things wrong. Um, but yeah, I think that within every region, in in, in South Asia. Um, you know, Bangladesh has done a good job on a number of human development indicators, despite being considerably poorer than India. If you look within India, you have desperately poor places like Bihar in northern India, where the state had kind of collapsed for decades and was being run as like a personal fife, and there were armies, like kind of private armies throughout the countryside. Um, uh, but for every Bihar, at least within India, you have a Maharashtra, um, where living standards are much, much higher, where the state provides much higher levels of goods and services. Um, now, of course, if you go to Maharashtra, it looks a lot worse than Hanover in a lot of different ways. But I, th I just think there's so many. And then on the taxes, yeah, yeah, let me come to the taxes. OK, so if it's a tax question, then yes. Um, developing country states struggle enormously to raise tax revenue. 
Um, and one of the things that we see in the growth and um, income gradient is that richer countries tax and spend at much, much higher rates than poor countries. Now, there are a number of different ways that we could understand that, but um, one of them is that tax capacity is really important because the state provides a lot of really valuable goods and services, and you need to collect money for it. Um, development economics, happily, is waking up to this to some extent, and a lot more work is being done on tax than ever before. A lot of my colleagues in the bank, but also Dina Pomerantz in Zurich and a lot of others um, are doing really, really terrific work on how to strengthen state capacity. And actually, it's one of those areas where people work together relatively well because it's, you know, they're not really in opposition. That The state there, when the World Bank comes in and says, you need to lower corruption, like people within the state are like, hey, screw you. Get away from us. We're doing all right with this corruption. Whereas um, when the World Bank comes in and says, hey, let's raise tax capacity, the state is like, yes, let's raise ta tax capacity because we can do so much more of the things we're trying to do. Some good, some bad, but I think on, on net, very good. So I think there are a lot of, as you see that gradient of income and, and tax collection, what it really tells you is that there have been tons of success stories. Okay. There are tons of middle-income countries who are able to raise much more money than... I'm reflecting Yeah, let's... Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, yeah. Thank you for your uh, presentation. Um, uh, just a couple of observations as a World Bank retiree. Uh, first of all, <clears throat> the uh, probably the biggest single failure of the bank in Africa, going back to your uh, uh, observation about freedom of choice, was in, um, uh, in e East Africa, where Bob McNamara and Julius Nieri adopted a program called Ujima which was to take uh, rural villages and force them into larger, medium-sized communities uh, with the view to improving productivity and improving standard of living. It was a total failure. Yeah. Um, the other observation was that there are quite a few actual uh, success stories in Africa, uh, Ghana, Mozambique before the tycoon, uh, South Africa, Botswana. Bo Botswana, Swaziland. There are many, many. If you look back 20 years and and uh, see what's happening today, there's been tremendous success. But the experience of the bank uh, over the many decades says one very, very important thing in rural areas or urban areas, that the most uh, successful thing that you can do is to help women educate themselves and provide good health services, particularly for women. Mm -hmm. And, and I, I, I mean, I don't have much to add to that other than the fact that I think women are among the groups denied the absolute most choice in who, who they marry, what they do, freedom to move outside of the house. Um, yeah, so I completely agree with you there. There's a lot, a lot that we can do a hell of a lot better. Um, okay, let's let, yeah, let's let's wrap up back there. Sorry, let's. Uh, Excuse me, uh, one thing that comes to mind is the impact of China coming in from the outside, and <laughs> you can tell us the rest. But I, I, I worry about, I just heard about their new Belt Road project and initiative, yeah. How yeah. much they suck out of regions and how much really benefits the, the local regions they're working in. Um. Their own workers to the places where they're moving in. In some places, yeah. Um, I don't have too much to say because we actually don't have nearly enough evidence on sort of what China is, is doing. I will say that the history of aid around the world has been largely for political reasons. And there have been a heck of a lot of projects that have been not the ones that would maximize poverty alleviation or, or growth, but that served some other political purposes. Um, China, yeah, is getting into bed with dictators, much like the US did. It's to be condemned in all circumstances, I think. But um, if we just think about the projects that they're doing, I don't see evidence for their sucking things dry. China is helping to build railroads, like just take Ethiopia. They, the, even the European Union couldn't resuscitate the European rail, to the railroad from Addis to, to Djibouti. Um, the Ethiopian state didn't do it for, for many decades. 
and it lay in total disrepair, despite the fact that Ethiopia is a landlocked country that faces very high transportation costs to, to do business with the rest of the world. Um, the Chinese came in, and they helped fix up the railroad. And now it's moving a lot of goods and a lot of people. Um, they built out the cell phone network. And now people in rural areas can gain access to the telephone network. Um, and it employs a lot, of, a lot of Ethiopians in the process. They do bring some Chinese laborers in. But, um, and that's something to think about, I guess. But um, I don't see a whole lot of evidence that they're bleeding things dry. Maybe in some of the deals, um, like people point out that, for example, Pakistan should be very concerned that they're getting huge investments from the Chinese, but it's, it's leading to huge amounts of debt. Um, that the, it's not clear that the state can pay off for these projects, but it's good for the leaders. Um, so, but I think the jury's a bit out on like, you know, these projects are often infrastructural projects, which I think are absolutely critical to growth and have been sort of underemphasized by both aid agencies and by uh, developing countries. So, I think I'm, I at least am taking a bit of a wait and see approach, but I am seeing on the ground a lot of positive effects. Okay. Thank you.